All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Adam Furtado. I'm the chief of product for Kessel Run, a US Air Force initiative uh, to revolutionize the way that the Air Force uh, builds and delivers software. I'll stand over here. All right, so all the opinions uh, are of mine alone and not of the US government, DOD, uh, or the US Air Force. Speaking at a Cloud Foundry summit after Keith Srini is a little intimidating, uh, I want to make it clear that I'm not a technologist. If you have questions about our uh, pipeline or our release engineering strategies, I can put you in touch with the right people. Uh, I'm a career intelligence professional, uh, dabble in organizational management, sprinkle a little IT on top. Um, so uh, in some ways, I'm a microcosm of what Cloud Foundry can provide. Uh, technology complexity abstraction. So in the same ways that our developers uh, are able to focus on their products, uh, I'm able to focus on uh, the things that are important to me, our larger digital transformation, uh, and our people. Uh, people are the most uh, important thing to me, and people are why Kessel Run's been as uh, successful as it has been. Uh, so while we have been um, focusing on our products, we've also been focusing on other things that have enabled our larger digital transformation Things like our security and testing and acquisition, the things that Brian and Tori talked about a little bit earlier today. We think that we've built a recipe for other uh, DoD organizations uh, to utilize in our work with working with Pivotal Labs and utilizing Cloud Foundry and thinking about our uh, people and our organization a little bit differently. Um, we are in the, the, the business of transforming the way that air warfare is fought. And we started very modestly with one single application uh, with Pivotal in trying to transform the way that we uh, optimize tanker planning or air refueling planning. Uh, Brian gave a really good rundown of this application earlier today. Um, so, but he also mentioned that modest uh, efforts can have major impacts. And we found that with this tanker planner application, uh, we turned it into an optimization software that helped us save the Air Force about a million dollars a week, uh, help us stop deploying about two airmen into harm's way, uh, away from their families, just from the efficiencies that we found. Um, so as we move forward, we're going into more complex areas to truly try to uh, optimize the way that we plan, execute um, uh, the war moving forward. So as the chief of product for Kessel Run, I certainly do care about our products and I uh, really want them to succeed and I'm concerned about that, but the, the more, I don't think that products are the most important thing. Uh, the most important things to me uh, are, you know, I think that great products are an outcome of the culture by which they're developed within. So I think that it's my job to develop a culture that allows for people to have growth mindsets and are able to learn and grow. And I think that the great products will be, um, you'll inherently come out of that if we do that in the right way. Uh, so some of our successes to date, we talked about a little bit earlier this morning. Uh, the first DOD team to achieve continuous delivery to CIPRNET, our operational uh, network. Um, this is a huge step for us, for all of us who worked within the DoD. Getting our actual capability to the warfighter has been a real challenge. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, uh, we're in the midst of uh, building an eight-node private cloud uh, to re uh, modernize the air, what the air operations center is, um, is utilizing and planning the air war on. Uh, again, we're transforming policy, testing security. Uh, we're disrupting the accreditation process with the help of some folks uh, and higher-ups in the Air Force. Um, we're focusing on changing the way that we think about products as well. Uh, with the help of Pivotal, they've helped us really adapt the way that we think about uh, the capabilities that we're providing, uh, focusing more on products uh, and not projects, and using those lean startup principles uh, to you know, focus on products in a different way. Um, one of the major things I want to talk about today is more of our cultural transformation. It's been one of the more important things that we've had to focus on. We've also tried to focus on our people and our people transformation. Uh, so far, we've turned 70 airmen into product managers, product designers and software engineers uh, utilizing things like lean startup principles, user-centered design, uh, and extreme programming. And when I say we've turned them into that, I mean that fairly literally. We've kind of had to start from scratch. Uh, the Air Force doesn't have those type of skill sets and roles inherently uh, on its own. Uh, so we've been able to focus on you know, different things to try to identify folks who can, we can grow into these roles. Um, so we focus on identifying things like people who have uh, user empathy or a growth mindset uh, or the ability to get out of their, their comfort zone uh, and try something new. We've had some pretty decent success with that so far. Uh, Isaac Taylor said that we're turning buzzwords into reality and PowerPoint theory into operational software. 
Um, I think a lot of times when uh, we get into forums like this with commercial industry and DoD talks about DevOps being innovative, uh, a lot of the industry probably scoffs at that. Uh, but when you, take into, uh, when you take innovation as the definition of the introduction of something new, what we're doing really is innovative in that uh, it, it's a ma massive change from well, the way that we were working before. Um, it hasn't always been this way though, right? Like the DOD hasn't always been uh, lagging in the innovation department uh, from the, the internet to the microchip to duct tape. Uh, the DOD was kind of out in front from an innovation perspective. One of the things that's had us uh, fall behind a bit was a lack of R&D spending moving forward. As you can see here, uh, in 1980, the Western world spent about $240 billion on scientific R&D. The Department of Defense was one sixth of that. Uh, as we move forward 20 years, uh, the Western world spending in that department gone up, went up by 50%, uh, but our spending in the DOD uh, went down. And also, in full disclosure, this is my first time speaking at a conference like this, and I really want to have pie charts uh, to build my credibility. Uh, boom, bar graph. Uh, <laughs> Cool, so, so what this is showing here is uh, uh, to, to follow up on what we just talked about, the commercial software industry has left us in its dust uh, in R&D spending in a lot of ways. Uh, Apple in 2016 sent the, spent the same amount of money in R&D as the entire defense industrial base, so all of our uh, defense contractors combined. Uh, if you combined Apple, Google, and Amazon, they outspent us four to one. Um, but the R&D spending isn't the only place we've uh, kind of struggled with uh, our innovation. It's also been really hard to even get things out into the field. Uh, Tori earlier today talked a lot about uh, how hard it is from our acquisition system and the bureaucratic nature of things to get our systems uh, out into the field. She showed a graph like this. Uh, we're on average right now of about eight years. Uh, it takes about eight years for IT systems to get delivered uh, within the government. That's not even taking into account the requirements process on the front end. So we're taking a li literally a decade to design a system without any real meaningful user input and providing systems to warfighters that they no longer need or never needed in the first place. Uh, so uh, ACC commander uh, General Holmes said, years of institutional risk aversion has led to the strategic dilemma we have today, replacing a 30-year fleet uh, on a 30-year timeline. Um, and so I know this to be true, because uh, I was one of those warfighters who really failed to get the capabilities to the warfighters. I spent 10 years uh, utilizing some of these systems or really developing workarounds to do my job in spite of our systems instead of being enabled by them. Um, just to show you that I'm not kidding. This is a picture of me in 2011 uh, using our systems. Um, <laughs> So uh, not only was I a warfighter before, but then I got myself into the acquisitions community where I became one of those guys who was giving the worthless systems to the warfighters. Uh, so I kind of know both sides of these things. Sometimes when you're inside the machine, it's hard to understand the damage that you're causing outside of it. Um, but there was some optimism in General Holmes' quote as it continued, this thing. <laughs> he said, this dilemma also provides us uh, an opportunity. And we think Kessel Run is that opportunity. Kessel Run was a team of people who were tired of working in this way and were trying to find avenues uh, to uh, work within the constraints that we're in to get the capability out to the warfighter uh, a lot faster. I think a lot of people this week are talking about how Cloud Foundry has enabled their business outcomes. Uh, what I want to focus on is how Cloud Foundry has enabled us, uh, enabled our people outcomes. So uh, one of the things we struggled with as a, as a leadership team in growing this team, we really were concerned about the lack of uh, inherent uh, organic engineering and software development talent within the Air Force. Uh, the Air Force actually has their own software, devel uh, software development enlisted AFSC or, or job code. It used to be in the thousands. It's dwindled down to under 500 uh, software developers whose primary duty is to actually write code for the Air Force. Uh, so this left us with a challenge. As we start to use these new technologies and build cloud native applications, uh, we were really concerned about how we are going to uh, grow this uh, from this core group of people with the engineering talent that we needed. But then we realized as we did our research uh, that commercial industry has already dealt with this as well. We've had people from the banking industry, um, uh, insurance, highly regulated bureaucratic entities have focused on how to uh, grow their talent in the same way. Uh, we learned a few things from them. Uh, one was that well, we need to, in the same way that b the, the banking industry had to uh, get more software developers than bank tellers, we need to transform the Air Force into a software uh, development, a software company. 
that delivers air power. Um, we've done that in a few ways. We have a pretty good recipe for it so far, we think, with Pivotal Labs, with Cloud Foundry, and thinking about our organization in a different manner. Uh, so for Pivotal, Pivotal has been huge for us in uh, enabling our team and growing our, our workforce. Uh, their paired model of pairing with their product managers, developers, and designers have allowed us to, to identify people who have that growth mindset and the, 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 the willingness to want to learn something new and pair them with industry ex experts uh, to really grow that uh, expertise. Um, so they're instilling a lot of lean principles. We're thinking about problems in a different way, um, trying to maximize value, eliminate waste, uh, think of things in a lean manner from a minimum vial product perspective. Uh, we're building a product foundation with them as well. Uh, we have a bunch of teams all over the, the, the country right now at various Pivotal Labs locations. We're working on different problem sets. Uh, and then eventually as we grow this core cadre of folks that uh, we can you know, organically have to grow this, uh, to move this forward in a very real way. Um, and they're also growing our organizational leadership. So they're not only focusing on our product teams and growing those people, but they're also helping us out and uh, learning how to actually lead an organization like this moving forward uh, in the right way. Uh, so from a Cloud Foundry perspective, it's really lowered the barrier of entry for us, abstracting a lot of that technical complexity. Um, we are very much understand that we're not, we don't have the in inherent uh, technical acumen that exists uh, elsewhere in industry within the Air Force. So Cloud Foundry has helped us uh, concentrate on growing our people in other ways. Uh, it's also increased the available partners that we can use. Uh, really no longer do you have to be a defense industrial based company that has a uh, heavy domain knowledge and, and understanding of the third party systems. It's kind of opened the door to other smaller, more innovative companies in some ways to also come uh, come work with us and work with the DOD. But uh, it's provided the underlying foundation uh, of what we're doing. Um, but the third thing I wanted to talk about is how we're thinking about our organization in a different way. Uh, Google with Rework did this study on uh, finding the, the best way to uh, identify the traits that made good managers and employees. And if you notice, the top seven things here are all soft skills and the STEM skills are came in at number eight all the way at the bottom of the list. Um, in our work, we kind of find, we've kind of landed in the same uh, kind of area that it was more important for us to, as we looked for folks to uh, work in this way, to find people with that learning mindset and the ability to grow more than it was people who had the inherent, uh, the technical skills already, so we can grow off of them. Um, so as we move forward, Google also did a study based on team effectiveness. Uh, and these are the five things that came out as the most important thing for, uh, for an effective team. Uh, and the interesting thing here is these things match up very well uh, with military culture inherently and the things that we know as military people and as veterans. Uh, so we'll go through, go through those. Uh, dependability. So dependability is inherent to military culture. Uh, there isn't a time where you're not relying on somebody else in the battlefield. Uh, it's the same way in our organization when we do modern software development. We have this balanced team model where our product managers are uh, relying on our developers or relying on our designers and vice versa. Uh, we have this uh, culture where people are uh, trusting of the people that they work with and help us move product forwards from a really uh, uh, substantial level. Uh, structure, so instilled in us is this kind of need and desire for uh, structure and discipline uh, for our veterans and for our uh, Air Force developers. Um, a lot of times when we get senior visitors who come to our lab and come to Pivotal, they get distracted by like the t-shirts and the sticky notes and the, the whiteboards, and it gives the impression that we're uh, working in this wild, wild west type of environment, when in reality all the practices that we are actually doing are, are very much disciplined. Uh, from our test-driven development, which we're very dogmatic about, to our schedules, 9.06 stand-ups, 12.30 hard lunches, 6 p.m. hard stops. All of those things are, are very disciplined and very structured. And it's fit like, amazingly well uh, with our Air Force folks who are used to working in some kind of a structured environment um, that, we've, uh, that we've become you know, used to. Uh, the third thing was meaning. Uh, so there's been a ton of studies uh, that have gone around about how this generation, they care more about meaning than money. A lot of the questions we get are based around retention. Uh, so you give these airmen a bunch of skills that they are, you know, they're more valuable in industry now. How do you keep them? Or more so, how do you get people from industry to come want to work with the government if we can't pay them enough? Uh, we have a hypothesis that's yet to be proven wrong, uh, that if you provide somebody with the, the right mission and the right meaning in their work, combine that with a great culture and work environment, uh, most people will be uh, willing to take a little bit less money in that environment. Not everybody. Uh, but in a lot of cases, that ends up being the case. So uh, recently, I was in San Francisco, and I saw this billboard, and there was this app about, uh, that helps you optimize the, the route you walked your dog on so they could pee on grass and not on pavement. 
So that was a really good idea. Um, but those guys can probably pay a lot more than the government can to revolutionize air warfare. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you think about what you accomplished that day, uh, we think that there's a, a big difference there when you go home and think about what you did uh, in, in working with us. So um, that's been something that we've been really concentrated on. Um, from an impact perspective, uh, what we're doing with Kessel Run is inherently good, regardless of political leanings or, or your general thoughts on, on, on wars. Um, we are being way more efficient, uh, saving a bunch of taxpayer dollars. Uh, we're being much safer by being more precise and providing uh, the right data to make better decisions off of. And we're actually preparing and, and growing uh, our airmen to, be, uh, to have skills to better transition out of the military uh, whenever that may be. Uh, so we're doing a lot of good things and providing impact at a very high level. Um, so if you look at those top four things there, um, all four are inherent to, to, to the military and to airmen and, and warfighters. So uh, we've found that in trying to develop this workforce to work in a different way from a technical perspective, the inherent things we need, the inherent skills that will help us grow into an effective team are already within us uh, with one fairly major difference, uh, psycholo uh, psychological safety. So psychological safety is based around uh, the feeling of acceptance and safety in your ideas and feeling free to uh, give your ideas without you know, fear of, of backlash and to feel comfortable. This is something that the, the hierarchical nature of the military doesn't usually uh, promote, but it's something that we've tried to promote at Kessel Run. Uh, so there are some ways that we've uh, tried to do that. Uh, the first is we've gotten rid of all the uniforms and made everybody uh, talk to each other on a first name basis. Uh, this seems fairly trivial, but it's kind of a big deal. Uh, the hierarchical nature of the military uh, and the top-down leadership is imperative uh, to, to warfare, imperative to be successful on the battlefield, but it thwarts innovation largely. Um, so even the concept of uniforms is to strip you away of your individualism, uh, where that individualism is where we actually get the creativity that we need to solve really complex problems. Um, so we've removed the um, uniforms on our operational floor. Everybody's on a first name basis and level set the playing field so that everybody feels free to ideate, share their ideas, uh, and be creative. That leads to our balanced team model uh, that you know, we worked with Pivotal uh, on. Uh, so we have product managers, product designers, and engineers all working together with shared ownership over all of our products and shared ownership over all of the ideas and the decisions that get made. Uh, so from this perspective, we have, uh, you know, we've had E4 product managers working with you know, majors and captains who are developing code. All of them are on a first name basis in the, in the, the level set. There's not a, a fear of groupthink or the highest paid person in the room or the highest ranking person's idea uh, winning out. And it's uh, not something that's new to the Air Force or new to the DOD. We have this uh, air crew model. It's based on uh, a meritocracy uh, largely. So the best person uh, for the job wins out. And then whoever's doing that job like, has the, the power to do so. Uh, so this isn't something new. It's something that our airmen have really like, adapted to and have really enjoyed. Uh, they've enjoyed working in this way and feeling more free to be creative uh, and ideate. One thing that we are working on is making, developing a feedback culture. So those of us who are, uh, have been in the military or are currently in the military, uh, we know that feedback is, uh, is, is almost inherently negative most of the time in the military, the way that we describe it. So uh, we've had to really work hard to make it so that feedback can be positive, can be constructive, uh, and want people to seek out feedback to figure out where their, their blind spots are and how they can learn better. Uh, so we've made a concerted effort to make feedback no longer look like that. Uh, and be a really productive thing. Um, and we have some work to do here, uh, but we're kind of uh, on the right path. Um, so I say all this to say that we're, we are on the right path to creating an environment that uh, we will be able to grow our engineers and grow our developers. Uh, and Brian mentioned earlier, our airmen have hope again. Uh, that's not just from our developers, that's also our, our warfighters. Uh, as we work with our users, they're starting to feel more a part of the process. They're starting to feel like they've uh, uh, played a part in like where things are going. Uh, we've gotten very good feedback. So um, this is just one of those things where uh, traditionally warfighters have felt ignored. I know that uh, I felt that way when I was one. Um, so now that they're a part of the process, we have really short feedback loops. Um, they can really drive where these capabilities are going, which has been really exciting for us to see. Uh, so three weeks from now, we are opening our own uh, software lab in downtown Boston. Um, to basically have a place that mimics Pivotal Labs and other tech industry companies uh, where our product teams can really thrive. Uh, we're calling it the Kessel Run Experiment Experimentation Lab, or CREL. 
Um, and we're taking with it all the things that we've learned. So we're taking, you know, leaving the cubicles behind and uh, taking the uh, open workspace concept. We're leaving the, we're taking the sticky notes and the whiteboards and leaving behind the staff meetings, uh, leaving behind the uniforms and, and taking our t-shirts and hoodies, right? The most important thing we're taking with us is like, what we've learned about culture, what we've learned about running an organization in this manner, and what we've learned about uh, having people with growth mindsets and trying to grow our people. Um, we called it an experimentation lab, not only because we're experimenting with our products um, and with our technical implementations, we're also experimenting with this, you know, the idea of culture and organizational management. Um, so uh, earlier this week, Eric Schmidt was testifying to uh, Congress in the state of DoD innovation. He said that the DoD violates every rule uh, in product design. Uh, and I, if you read the rest of it, he wasn't really just talking about thinking of things in a minimum viable product perspective or build the next most valuable thing. It's also just kind of the entire ecosystem of how we uh, are uh, building capability and growing our people uh, from an innovation perspective. So um, with that, that is all I got. Uh, are there any questions? All right, thank you.